Yes, it's Christmas. Happy opening day, ladies and gents. Uh, we've been waiting about five months for this, four and a half, five months for this, but it is finally here today, Thursday, March 28th, is opening day in Major League Baseball. Jack Aram on the Just Baseball Show on this lovely Thursday. It's good. What's your plan today? I know that uh, we, like we're recording on Wednesday afternoon. You're flying in the morning, but you should touch down before first pitch anywhere. Are you just going to be sitting here like in hog heaven? What's the deal? Yeah, I'm going to get home as quick as I can uh, back from the airport. Hopefully it's not too too difficult to to get there. I mean, it's always brutal from the New York airports, but uh, try to get my butt on the couch by the 1 p.m. starts and and have my laptop out and be canvassing the data while flipping between all the games like we're going to talk about the the opening day starters you know starting matchups that we're most excited to watch but uh just going to try to bounce around as many as i can uh but with that it, it's a delicate balance though dude because you don't want to bounce bounce too much to where you're you feel like you're not seeing enough of any of the games but you do want to get around a little bit too so i think quick pitch is an awesome tool and i want to get that out of the way like i love nfl red zone i love what quick pitch is on mlb network i think that it is an amazing thing for sheer baseball fans and fantasy baseball players that like want to keep tabs on absolutely everybody. It's awesome. But I I'm with you. I guess I'm old school ish in the way that I want to settle into the flow of a certain game. D you have two TVs that you can work with at your apartment, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So maybe have like main game and then like whip around down yeah, below. That that's usually the move. Yeah, I, I just want to have a feature game at all times. Here's our rundown for today's show. Will Smith obviously agreed to a a, a big time deal. Um, Jordan Montgomery to a little time deal with Arizona, but fascinating. Uh, Matt McClain and Jordan Lawler, unfortunate injury news. John Birdie is now a New York Yankee. Now, Yuki Uesawa uh, is a Boston Red Sox. And then at the end, we're going to draft our opening day games. Like we're pretty much power ranking them, but we're going to snake it. And it's like, hey, I really like Braves Phillies. I assume that's going to be number one off any board because it's Strider Wheeler, spoiler alert. But uh, we are going to factor in the postponements too. What stinks is we're getting opening day postponements, which is just like not fun. Yeah. How many do we have so far? Two so far. And there might be more, right? Is it just weather? It's just tearing through the East Coast? Yep classic just She's not fun. timing is crazy it's crazy 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 let's start with will smith of the la dodgers 10 years 140 million dollars we talked about will smith as a market setter this is not setting the market he got 14 mil a year granted for 10 years like hey you never give a catcher a 10-year deal having said that will smith is a guy that you can close your eyes and totally see a dh or maybe even a first baseman at the end of this deal um this felt like a relative heist for the L.A. Dodgers, but looky here, the L.A. Dodgers spending money when very few other teams are spending money. And I want to give credit to the Arizona Diamondbacks. I want to give credit to the Cincinnati Reds for you know going for it this offseason. But man, this has been the offseason of the L.A. Dodgers. And 24 hours before opening day, the Dodgers like drove the stake through the heart of the rest of the league again. They have money to spend and they're going to do it. It's such an interesting contract, isn't it? Like 10 years, 140 million. Yeah, it's it's just it's unique from that perspective. I, I imagine that the conversation was one of those classic like I'm not going to negotiate once the season starts because players just like to focus on playing. And you know, it's got to be difficult to be talking about an extension while you're playing. Um, so I think that's why the Dodgers wanted to just get this done. And I'm sure Will Smith before the season. But I'm so interested to see, and I'm sure it'll be out by the time the episode's out, like the complete breakdown of the money, because I, I understand that they're buying out, you know, a couple of years, but still, it just seems like this has got to be one of the most team friendly deals. It could age as one of the most team friendly deals in baseball. I feel like as, as he continues to progress and yeah, I think he's going to be good. Even if he's, if, if the catching on the back end of the deal is not as good, that bat's always going to play. Yeah. This is going to be one of the better contracts I think in baseball. I think so. Um, Buster Posey previously held the record for longest deal for a catcher at nine years, 167. Less total money, even though that deal was signed nine years ago, going into the 2013 season. Uh, but Will Smith, 10-year deal is the longest for a catcher, and that kind of speaks to, you know, it's it's similar to me 
to the the Joe Maurer conversation. And obviously these guys are different players. Like Will Smith is not a first ballot Hall of Famer. Joe Maurer was a guy that was going to contend for batting titles. But Maurer was a guy that everybody was like, okay, he's going to hit for the entirety of his career. If he needs to move, if he needs to go play a corner outfield, if he needs to go play first base, so be it. We just need to have the bat in our game for 20 years. That's yeah. Will Smith's kind of bat where it's like, the bat is going to be middle of the Dodger lineup caliber for the next 10 years, and you'll figure out the defensive stuff later. We have yeah. seen blue chip catching prospects make their way through the Dodgers organization. And the prospect industry has soured on Diego Cartaya, understandably so. He was not good last year, but Dalton Rushing is a top 50 prospect in all of baseball. Tyrone Lorenzo is a guy that was a fringe top 100 guy that could make his way into top 100s around the industry by the middle of this year. What you have done is clearly say, hey, we've got our guy. I think the Dodgers could be really, really aggressive this deadline. And they could factor in a rushing or a Lorenzo to a big deal or maybe a Cartaya to a big deal if teams are still fooled by that. This creates a whole bunch of flexibility for them knowing that they've got their guy that's already there, that's already produced long term. It, that's the other fascinating part is if you're Dalton rushing, you know, if you're some of these other top guys and in rushing is a guy that I think is clearly jumped to, to be the top catching prospect in the system. And, you know, you got Lorenzo, who you mentioned is, is really exciting. And, but you, you don't really worry about that because he's years and years away. Rushing could be a year away. You know, I, I, I think by next year it could potentially debut. He's going to he's Tulsa. We bat. know that they, he's going to be in double A. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think he could quickly fly through there. So there's a new, I think, approach to where a lot of these offensive minded catchers, they can have two of them on a roster. You know, I think more teams are going to start doing that, especially when, you know, you could DH one of them. And you know, I don't know what the plan will be, you know, because they do have Otani. They do have other guys that they're going to want to put in the DH spot. So it's going to be fascinating, but I just don't even think they're worried about that. The Dodgers are always operating at the big league side. They're not worried about blocking guys or anything like that. But to your point, Knowing that you've got Will Smith for sure now locked up for the next decade, if if a team really wants a couple of your catching prospects, because those are a couple of their better guys, you could maybe pull that trigger now and not be as worried about, oh, well, what happens if Will Smith is gone and you know we don't really have a, a clear cut next in line guy. So not only does it give them give them a, a really strong situation in terms of, hey, maybe they can be a little bit more aggressive with their trade capital on top of that. Uh, you, you got your your backstop situation settled for the next decade, or at least close to it, even if you move them off there eventually. The deal reportedly includes deferred money. This is going to be a thing, isn't it? Yep. Well, which is crazy at 14 AAV, we're, we're, we're deferring still. Yeah, like it, it does feel like, it feels like the Dodgers are almost operating... At, at like a salary cap that they've set for themselves, even though like you look at the LA Dodgers and salary cap, those things do not belong in the same sentence at all. But it feels like they're setting their own arbitrary cap that's well above the competitive balance tax. And they're just like, oh, yeah, you know, we want to stay under this number. So we're not paying X amount of tax penalties. And like, OK, I get it. But you're still blowing the rest of the league out of water out of the water when it comes to, you know, total salary. It's probably the Cohen that. tax. That's probably right around where they they don't want to go over. I'd imagine. You think so? Is that the second apron? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, I don't know. I, I can't do the accounting anymore because I don't know what's deferred. I don't know. What, I know Track does that. But again, we got to wait for a lot of those things to get updated. I mean, we, we kind of figured that Will Smith was never going to go anywhere. I, I just again, I'm really surprised by the finances of the, of the deal. Do you, how many years of control did he have left? I think it was two. Um, That's I'll pull crazy it up right to now. me. Like you're telling me this guy isn't worth more than that? Like look, look at what JT Rio Muto got. I, had, I feel like, and that was years ago and he's older he at the time. From nah, it's about the same age actually. Yeah, this is his age 29 season. This was going to be his second R beer. So he was going to be up after the 2025 season. Okay. And the thing that I do actually kind of, not even realizes Smith's a little bit older, um, yeah, which is 28, which is fascinating. Like what well, real Muto was actually younger at the, at the time of the deal. So that does add a little bit more, you know, to it. But it, again, it's, I still think it's an absolute heist that said, you know, when he's 38, he may not be you know, giving you much defensively and he still has that money guaranteed. But for him, I think for Will Smith, it's like, okay, I just guaranteed myself $140 million. Sure. At some points I might be giving 
you know, leaving a lot of money on the table. But I think it just seems to be one of those situations where he doesn't really care. He's going to play for a World Series every single year, most likely. And he's going to be fine financially, no matter what, even if there is some money left on the table. I'm interested to see if there's a lot of incentives in there. I wouldn't be surprised. Things that kind of scale that up. But I mean, what what a deal for for the Dodgers. Speaking of leaving a lot of money on the table, Jordan Montgomery is an Arizona Diamondback. Yeah. One year, $25 million. He has a $25 million vesting option. And let me walk you through the criteria here. He gets an opt-out in 2025 if he makes 10 starts this year. So on his 10th start, that becomes a player option pretty much. Um, the player option would be $20 million with 10 starts. If he makes 18 starts, that's $22.5 million for next year. And if he makes 23 starts, he's tw- he's owed $25 million. So the reality is the max of this deal is two years for 50. I was thinking four years for 100 for yeah. Jordan Montgomery. And like, oh, okay, Blake Snell gets a one plus one. Bellinger gets a one plus one, whatever. This was like the one Boris guy that deserved a long-term deal. This mm-hmm. guy's put up an ERA in the mid threes and has thrown what, 180 innings plus, 170 plus each of the last two years. And did and it on the postseason stage a, too. Yeah, and he's getting a one plus one. And not even the one plus one. It, it, it's like one and he has to earn the plus one. That's the crazy part. And it's easy. to. It's a very attainable target here. A guy that pitches a lot, just needing to pitch a lot. And But still, I think it's crazy to me that, yes, it's a player option. But again, like if he gets hurt this year, unfortunately, he's not going to be able to pick up that option at, at anything more than 20 million. Or if he doesn't make 10 starts, then you know, he, he doesn't even have that that option like that is crazy to me that he's leveraged against that hard uh, when he seemed like the shoe in to at least be a three, four year deal guy. I, I agree with you. Like he's safe. He's, he's been so durable. He's been getting better and better. He pitched on the big stage. He just turned 31. He t- strikes me as a kind of guy that's going to age well because he doesn't, he, he's a pitcher, right? He, and he, and yes. he mixes. He's not a guy that's going to desperately need velocity to succeed. It is shocking to me. This was, I agree with you. The Boris of all the Boris failures this spring training or this this off season and it's spring training technically because that's the only time he has this guy sign uh, i i got i gotta say this is the most surprising one not because he's the best or anything like that but because of what you said just how safe he is and the fact that on top of it he has to earn the ability to pick up an option for the same amount in the second year is crazy like if he hits the best incentive marker there right if he makes those 23 starts he has the opportunity to have the same deal again. That's absurd. It's barely more than the QO. I, I can't I can't believe it. I, I, I just wonder if players are going to start saying, look, I don't know if it's Boris's fault or not, but regardless, if teams aren't willing to negotiate with you, I, I, I can't do that. I can't be your client. Like, I wonder if he's going to continue to bleed clients because no matter what you want to blame it on, if you want to say he's being you know blackballed by teams or whatever it is, I, I don't know the p- politics of it. But all I can see is the results, and the results are terrible, and, absolutely terrible. And I, I get that there is sex appeal to the name of Scott Boris, and I know that there are probably a lot of young baseball players that are really good that look at the guy that negotiated A-Rod's contract and the guy that's going to negotiate Juan Soto's contract next year. Juan Soto's going to get paid, not because he's a Boris client. Yeah, he's I can gonna- negotiate that thing. Yeah, he's going to get paid because he's Juan Soto. Like, a reminder, Shohei Otani's CAA. CAA got Shohei Otani $700 million. And mm-hmm. it's not because of CAA. It's because of Shohei Otani as a player. The agent is just a vehicle. And this vehicle needs to go to the pound at this point. Like, it, it's it's a very weird thing. And he's always going to have clients because of the precedent that he has set for himself. And credit to Scott Boris. He's made his clients a ton of money over the last, you know, decades, like two plus decades. But it might be time to look elsewhere and look at at the agencies that you know are not a sore spot for organizations. It's clear that like he's not that good at this right now. Yes. I, he's I, good I mean, at it with the top flight guy. He's not good at it with the mid-tier guy. I mean, dude, look at like uh and I know it's a lower AAV, but look at like Jameson Tyone. Not nearly doing anything as impressive as Montgomery had done recently. 
and and with injury history and all that good stuff and and at the same age when they when he signed his his, his contract with the Cubs, four years for sixty eight million dollars, and a ten team no trade clause. I again I know that that's less that's seventeen million AAV. But I mean, do you think do you think that Montgomery would prefer that? Or do you think he'd prefer the one plus one and hit free agency again? I, I'd assume the latter because that's where Boris pushed him. And he's probably saying, hey, you know, we'll get you a bigger deal a year from now. But I, I'm just looking at Jamison Tyone getting four years for $68 million, And I'm like, you can't get four years for $80 million for Montgomery? Like, you, you can't do that? That's outrageous. I mean, I know Montgomery would, would take that. That's only yeah. $5 million less AAV and guaranteeing yourself way more money. God yeah. forbid you have an injury, anything like that. And I mean, Tyone even got a 10 team, no trade clause annually. That That is where I'm shocked that, I mean, when you have the precedent of some of those pitchers as well, like it makes it even more eye opening that that uh, that Montgomery wasn't able to get more money. That said, from the from the Diamondback side, oh my God. With, the, with the injury to Eduardo Rodriguez and, you know, we're, we're waiting to see how, when he's going to come back. Now you got Montgomery plugging right in which is great. So you don't feel that as much in the beginning of the season. And then when Erod comes back, this rotation is really, really, really solid, man. Like, I mean, really dude, solid. The D backs are serious. We, I, I said it, you know, and, and I feel very strongly that the X factor for the Arizona Diamondbacks before this Jordan Montgomery signing was the five star. Is it Ryan Nelson? Is it Tommy Henry? Are they going to be serviceable? Cause that's 20% of your team's games. It's mm -hmm. 20% of your team starts. Now, at full health, Brandon Fott is the five. That's a great rotation. And you give me Gallon, Kelly, Jamon, Erod, Fott. I mean, one of them turns into a swingman in the postseason. They got to get there first, but this offense is exciting enough. The bullpen is good enough. We saw what Kevin Ginkle can do and like, hey, we'll see what Saul Frank can do this year. We'll see what some of the other guys can do this year. But man, that rotation, there are very few that are better than that rotation. I, I'd take Seattle's over them. I would take the Dodgers and Braves over them, but I mean, they, they could be a top five rotation in baseball. I mean, big reason why, you know, I was a little skeptical about the D-backs was that rotation. Same, same thing because, you know, Gallon, ton of work, you know, ton of innings on that arm. And then the postseason, Merrill Kelly, 35, you know, and he's gonna be 36 by the end of the season. They need those guys to be available and healthy and, and, being the one-two punch that they were last year. And I was worried, okay, well, if one of them goes down, then things could get ugly really quick on top of the fact that you already are relying on, in the meantime, Tommy Henry, Ryan Nelson. But you add Montgomery now to the fold there. I mean, it just gives it gives you so much calm. Yeah. I, I think you can just, even if there's some inconsistencies with the rotation, just Gallon, Kelly, Montgomery, and Fott as your, you know, even now with with no Erod, Fott as your four is, is great. It's great. And Fod is your five. He could be one of the best number fives in in, in the game. Uh, if anything, he could almost leapfrog Erod, and Erod could end up being one of the best number fives in the game. Regardless, whoever, however you want to stack it up. So it just gives me a lot more calm. And also with no Erod, this rotation, the only lefty was Tommy Henry, who you know I think you prefer in a swingman type of role, yes. spot starter type. So you get that left hander. You don't have all of your eggs in the in the basket of Eduardo Rodriguez, which you know I like the signing, but I was a little bit nervous just to see how he's going to do out there. And now you got to feel really good about the Diamondbacks' chances to you know prove that last year wasn't a little bit of of lightning in a bottle. And I think it was a little bit of lightning in a bottle, but then they made the team better. And that's yeah. what you do when you have a special season, but you're young, and uh, you, you might have think that you outkicked your coverage a little bit. Make sure that your coverage is even better next year. Yeah, and that's put, exactly you, what they've done. You put your foot on the gas. Last thing when it comes to Jordan Montgomery, it's really hard for me to think that the Boston Red Sox couldn't beat this deal. It's really <laughs> hard for me to think that the New York Yankees could not beat this deal. And the Yankees were reportedly trying to get back involved with Jordan Montgomery. Do you think that Montgomery had a choice and he chose against those two teams and he wanted to go to the younger, exciting, you know, maybe he liked the Southwest too. Like, I don't, I don't know. It's it's hard for me to think that if the Red Sox were were guaranteeing, you know, 20 more million dollars that he would choose the Arizona Diamondbacks, but we may just be at that point where the Red Sox have not shown a commitment to better the team around him while the Diamondbacks have shown a commitment to better the team around their starting pitching. Absolutely. I, I think well, in the Red Sox situation, if it's a one plus one, 
you don't want to be in a spot where you can get moved again. He just got moved, right? Like he just had to deal with that last year and it worked out really nicely for him. He won a world series, but you don't want to get traded every year and play on four different teams in, in multiple years. And you know, I know with him, like you get to your thirties, early thirties, you probably want to start building your life a little bit more consistently yeah. and not being bouncing around to all these different cities all the time. Uh, so, you know, he probably figures he's going to hit free agency next year or pick up that option. No matter what, he's already going to probably have another team uh, that he's going to play for or he'll re up with Arizona. But I do genuinely think that, what you said is true where I, I I do think he he preferred to, to be in Arizona younger yeah. team. They're clearly invested in winning now. Maybe this is a team that could be interested in extending him long-term if things go well this year and, and they really like him. But on top of that, I mean, Red Sox, they're probably not going to be great. They're probably going to move you for prospects. If, if they get the opportunity Yankees, He's been there, man. Like he's he's played there. He it, it's it's not for everybody. And Montgomery never had any issues there. He actually had a nice career. And I know Yankees fans appreciated everything he did. It. And he yeah. he never got knocked or anything. Like he was always even keel. But you don't know what it was like for him. Like he could have easily just been like, okay, I've had enough of that. I don't need to go back to that New York market for yeah. for that amount of money. So I, I think that could easily be a big part of it. And and if I were him, I'd rather play for the Diamondbacks. It's so. just as serious. They're just as competitive. They were just in the World Series. He just he faced them. He got to see them up close and personal and see, you know, what that team was like. And I'm sure that was eye-opening for him. And it's I think a, a different opportunity for him to be the vet on on this team and still be able to compete. Yeah. Uh new arm in the American League East. And we're gonna get through the rest of the headlines, you know, somewhat quickly, and then we're gonna draft uh opening day games that we want to watch. New arm in the AL East is Naoyuki Uesawa, who did not make the Tampa Bay Rays opening day roster. So instead of going to Durham, the Rays in turn traded him to Boston. I'd assume for like cash considerations or something somewhat minor. But Naoyuki Uesawa is going to be a major league pitcher. He's going to pitch for the Boston Red Sox. What can Red Sox fans expect from Uesawa? Yeah, so you know, the the thing that I keep seeing is like, oh well, if the Rays are letting an arm go, then you know, he can't. It's especially into the division, like he can't be that good. But blah, blah blah blah. Obviously, he's not a mid rotation starter, but there's a chance he could be a back end of the rotation starter, or at the very least, a mop up guy. And, and the Red Sox need somebody that can just eat innings, and he's a guy that can definitely eat innings. But it's it's a really unique feel to spin the baseball. He can create crazy you know, induced vertical break and ride on his fastball, despite it only being about ninety to ninety one miles per hour. But he's got some really unique characteristics to his stuff and can manipulate the baseball and, and give you the kitchen sink, like Aaron Savali type of, you're going to get all these different pitches coming in all these different directions. I feel like Boston's the perfect place for him with, you know, the, the, the crew that you're going to have over there with Breslow. And then you also have, you know, the ties to, to, to drive line with Kyle Bodie and things like that. So I, I think this is a spot where, he can kind of maximize some of those things because he's a big pitch characteristic guy. And, you know, again, the Red Sox just need innings to be eaten. People talking about, oh, why would the Rays let him go? He can't be that good anyways. Well, of course, he's not going to be great, but he's also not a slouch just because the Rays let him go. He had an upward mobility clause in his deal, meaning, you know, if he wasn't going to make the team, he could get out of there and get an opportunity to get moved elsewhere. And the Rays are perpetually in a a 40-man crunch. He wasn't on the 40-man roster. He was a minor league deal. So they didn't have room for him on the 40. They, they're going to move him. The Rays pinch out good players all the time. All the it's time. Because their their 40 man is so loaded. They, so they pinched that's out a short sided way to see it. It's a good they, pickup by the Red Sox. 100%. They also pinched out a 90 to 91 good IVB guy in Joe Ryan. Like, yes. Don't forget that Joe Ryan was a Ray that was a victim of a 40 man crunch. And guess what? He looks like a, a front to middle rotation guy in Minnesota for a team that can win a division. Yep. Totally agree. A uh, couple other guys that I want to get to here. Um, John Birdie is now also in the AL East. He was traded by Miami to the Yankees. Do we know what the return was? I just saw Birdie was yes. going to New York. Yes. So Shane Sasaki raised, it's a three team trade. So Shane Sasaki from the Rays to the Marlins, Ben Rortvet, the catcher mm. from the Yankees to the Rays, and then a Yankees prospect that's become like a, you know, like a, Prospect analyst darling John Cruz, 18 year old, that put up some good numbers on that Yankees complex super team going over to the Marlins, who actually will become the Mar- one of the Marlins' like five or six best prospects immediately, which oh. is more of an indictment on the Marlins system. <laughs> 
Birdie is a great get for the Yankees. Back-to-back two war seasons. They needed some speed in that lineup. DJ's out. As well to Cabrera, just he's struggling. Yeah. And I, I, it's been tough to watch. I think Peraza's hurt, right? So uh, John Birdie can plug in at third base immediately. He'll probably be the opening day starter there. But even when you get DJ back, he's an insurance policy for the often injured DJ LeMayhew. But he also got run at shortstop for the Marlins where he's passable. He got run at third base, left field, right field. He can plug in center in an emergency. He's played second. Like he's the perfect utility guy. He led the league in stolen bases a couple years ago. He's somebody that I think adds a dynamic aspect to this Yankees lineup that they've kind of been missing. And even if he's not starting every game, I think this was a great pickup for them. On the Marlins side, they have a terrible farm system. They got two decent prospects that are instantly going to slot, I think. Sasaki in their top 20, Cruz easily in the top 10. So um, Birdie was also like kind of part of the middle infield log jam that was going on in Miami where Berger's going to get everyday reps at third base. But you got a Vidal Brujan, you got an Xavier Edwards. I mean, Tim Anderson's a shortstop now. Birdie was probably the best of the bunch. But the thing is, we're, we're talking about third middle infielders at this point because it's going to be a rise at second. It's going to be T.A. at short, Berger at third. Those are the spots that Birdie can play. So Birdie was going to be utility man off the bench. You know, if you can redeem some value for your utility man off the bench, you do it, especially when yeah. you have a guy that is going to punch at, what, a 5% clip in Xavier Edwards? Like, hell, 8%? Like, we'll see. I, and, and the thing that's tough with the Marlins is yeah, Birdie's probably one of their, their better players. You know, yeah. I, I think when you look at the war perspective and what he's going to do for them, but one more year of control. Here's the big thing. He's owed, what, like close to $4 million this year? He's he's more expensive. Yes. Like He's more expensive than... Nick Gordon, I think. He's going to definitely more expensive than Vidal Brujan. He's also better than them, but like the Marlins are going to tell you that they're trying to compete this year. I don't think they're waving the white flag, but this was their opportunity to get some prospect return. You know, they don't have a ton of assets that they're going to be able to move and they got they get some. some prospects back. I, the part that I struggle with is I think Vidal Brujan could end up being one of the worst qualified hitters in Major League Baseball this year. You think year. he's going to qualify? I don't even know if he qualifies. I don't think he finishes the year, but he has no options. So the Marlins had to. And that's the interesting thing is they go get Nick Gordon, Vidal Brujan, a pair of guys that have no options. So, I mean, you're kind of, your hands are tied. Nick Gordon belongs on a big league roster, so that's sure. fine. But Vidal Brujan, like, I, the, if, if the reason why they moved Birdie is because they wanted a roster spot for Brujan, it makes it harder to to pow it. But I think it's more, it was more financially motivated. And also, let's get some prospects into the system that is one of the worst in Major League Baseball. Yeah. Um, also, Yankee fans, quick PSA. If you think this is them trying the Tim LaCastro thing again, don't do that to John Birdie. He's way better than Tim LaCastro was. He provides I think they're going to like Birdie. Value. I think they're going to like Birdie. He's a gamer, dude. Like he's always going to take the extra 90. I look like he's going to get his jersey dirty. Like all of the clichés that your little league coach wanted you to like do and like the yeah. way he wanted you to play. Like Birdie does that. The Marlins fans called him like called it Birdie Ball. Like he's just a guy that you're going to root for and uh, you just love what he brings to the team, especially for a team that I know frustrates Yankees fans where it's like, oh my God, sometimes it looks like they don't give a shit. Like, geez, he Birdie's going to be that spark plug that I think fans are going to love just how hard nosed he is. And and he's a great guy as well. I, I've had nothing but great interactions with him when I cover the Marlins games. I, I love that. He's going to add a level of give a shit to the New York Yankees, which yes. I mean, the New York Yankees need give a shit. Couple unfortunate injury points that I want to point out before we get to the opening day games. Jordan Lawler, I just got the notification, is out eight to ten weeks with a thumb issue. He just underwent surgery to to kind of correct that thumb issue. So Lawler, I don't think the decision was made knowing that Lawler was hurt to have Perdomo just be the opening day shortstop and the everyday shortstop to start the year. But really helps that you didn't make that decision. You you know did something to Geraldo Perdomo mentally and and now you got to shove him back in. Perdomo is the guy is the guy for at least the next 10 weeks and let's hope that Lawler, you know, gets healed quickly and it and it is only like 2 two and a half months because this year feels huge for a Jordan mm-hmm. Lawler, a guy that already has his big league debut under his belt and um I mean the Diamondbacks are hoping is going to be a huge piece of their future and they're trying to win games right now. You know, I, I do wonder if the thumb was affecting him a little bit during spring training and maybe even at the Probably back was. end of last year. It doesn't just come out of nowhere unless he had a specific, you know, acute injury to it. But usually that stuff is kind of wear and tear, especially for hitters like that. 
Um, it's tough, but I think for the for the D backs, like this was the plan all along, like you said. So it, it does hurt their depth and it does hurt because you know, you were you're kind of hoping that okay, yeah, Perdomo's hovering around a low 700s OPS. And if he starts to slump second half of the season, you bring up Waller and he kicks things into gear for you and can be that X factor. But you know, that could still happen. It just might be a little bit more difficult because he's gonna have to ease his way back in. It, it's at the end of the day, he's so young, he got up so quick. You never want an injury, but this is something that you know he can easily come back from, and and it shouldn't be too much of. He shouldn't take him off a of course too much. One that is going to take this guy off course and going to take the Cincinnati Reds off course entirely is Matt McClain, who had pretty much season-ending shoulder surgery. They said they're hopeful to get him back by season's end, but he had a he had his left shoulder, he had his labrum repaired, and some damaged cartilage removed in his left shoulder. That was according to uh, Nick Crawl, who spoke to the media about that. That's his lead shoulder as a right-handed mm-hmm. hitter. Um, that is not his throwing shoulder. So it shouldn't be like too much of an issue defensively, but offensively, I mean, we've talked about it, man. Corbin Carroll was having shoulder issues. Uh, Drew Jones was having shoulder issues. Shoulder things as a hitter, you can speak to it way better than I can, but those those feel serious. Yeah, I've, just being able to talk to guys that have had that um, that lead shoulder it can just get really – guys can kind of feel stuck when they get to their launch position. A lot of times it just it doesn't feel right when they try to get that swing going. Um, it, it takes time. Some guys come back and they're, and they're totally fine. Look at Andy Pajes. Uh, yeah. But – you know, it, I'm I'm very interested to see how he bounces back, and you know, it's it's such a tough blow because I'm a huge fan of his. Um, he's a guy that, I mean, before he got hurt, was was incredible. Uh, 89 games, a 3.2 F4, 16 bombs, 14 bags, played good defense. I mean, this was a guy that really was going to be an X factor for them this year. Injuries are a bit of a concern, though. He's had some history of, of injuries, even going back to the minor leagues. And then last year, he was banged UCLA up. UCLA, too. Didn't he have some issues at UCLA? I, I believe so. I, I, I'm i not positive, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So it, this is something that is worth monitoring. Uh, and, and hopefully this time off, repairing the shoulder, kind of get him to get his whole body right. And uh, hopefully the, the Reds can get him back for the end of the year because he, he could be that boost that they need. And, and he is a, just a really dynamic player. Man, tell you what, the Santiago Espinal deal, especially with Marte suspended for 80 games and all the other injuries that they were dealing with, the Espinal move felt big when it happened. It feels huge on the heels of this McLean news. Oh, man. I mean, he's going to be a lot better than anybody else that they were just going to bring up there and shove in. And unfortunately, Edwin Arroyo with his shoulder, too, uh, one of their top prospects. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if he would have reasonably got up this year, but it's just like anybody that you could have even brought up rushed in an emergency. And it seems like even their depth is getting knocked out a little bit. So it, it's tough right now. I don't know what's going on in Cincinnati. It's just it, it been bit by the injury bug like none other. Something in the water, I guess. Also, I just went to Fangraphs to pull up the Reds depth chart and Bo Bichette's player page came up. I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> like, oh, oh. My God. oh. It oh, was man. fun. It was fun. I will say that it was fun. No, it was a blast. As was, of right I now, didn't realize we did it for 20 minutes. I, I didn't know if people were going to be like, that was ridiculously long. That sucked. People uh, liked it. But a lot of people thought it was funny. So I'm glad. As Sorry looked, for those that may have thought it dragged out, but yeah. it, was, it was a good time. It was a good time. Um, as it stands right now, here's Fangraph's projected opening day lineup for the Cincinnati Reds um, in the infield. Like the outfield is, is steer in left. Uh, I mean, I guess Benson in center, maybe Bubba Thompson in center, and then Benson or Fraley in right. Um, hell, maybe Fraley in center. But the infield is CES at first, Jamer at third, Elliot short, India at second, and Nick Martini is the DH. <laughs> Couldn't you just DH India and have Espinal play second? I feel like that's probably the best version. That's, that's probably the, the lineup they'll roll with. I, I would assume so, uh, behind Frankie Montas. So we will see. We will see. But without further ado, uh, let's draft the opening day games that we most want to watch. So first pick is going to be the game that it's like, oh, I'm not missing a pitch of this. And then the last game is like, who is that starting for who? Yes. And who are they playing? We're going to snake it. Arm, I will let you have the first overall pick. So I get two oh, and three, you get four. There are two postponements as of right now. We are going to include those postponements. So on the board still is Milwaukee at the Mets and Atlanta at Philly. So Arm Layton, what are you picking first? 
I mean, the number one pick's got to be Atlanta at Philly. And once that game happens, I mean, it'll be worth the wait as well. Uh, you, you mentioned it off the top. Like, you're going to get two of the best pitchers in the game. You're going to get two of the best lineups in the game. And you're going to get all of the jazz that comes with opening day, whether it's a day later, whatever it is. Like, it, that that's the, the game to watch. And I think that's a game that everybody should be tapped into and, and really excited about. So that's easily my first pick. I like that. Very, very simple. Um, this is where things get a little crowded because there is no like true, true ace off that we have right now. If it was Fromber versus Garrett Cole, I would have taken Houston and New York too. I'm going to go elsewhere. My second or my first pick. So I guess the second overall pick I'm going to Arlington. Cubs Rangers, Justin Steele, Nathan Eovaldi, the debut of Wyatt Langford, Evan Carter mm-hmm. in the lineup. The Rangers are not getting their rings on Thursday. I think they get them on Saturday. But like this is a Cubs team that wants to compete, and Cody Bellinger's back in the lineup. Rings, and we're expecting huge things from a Seiya Suzuki type guy. Um, going up against the reigning world champs, I, I've got them with the second pick. Uh, we'll snake it again. I'm still going to stay away from the Yankees and Astros. I'm actually going to go to Toronto and Tampa. Zach Eflin, Jose Barrios. Ooh. That's pick three for me. I'm fast. It, it might be a reach, but I think it could be like a 2-1 game. If Eflin shoves again, I'm just going to be fully convinced that the Rays are winning the A at least. Convinced. That's fair. I mean, I want to see I want to see Eflin on opening day. Uh, I think that's going to be a fun one to watch. Um, there's a couple that are so tough now because it's like one, and I'm mostly basing these decisions off of the starters, uh, yeah. but th- there's some like additional things like a length for debut, like you mentioned, some other things that could be interesting. My pick's going to be San Francisco versus San Diego in San Diego, four o'clock start Eastern time. Logan Webb, you Darvish. That alone is super exciting. The, the, something about the Padres, they just grab me. Like, even when they're not good, I still watched so many games last year. The Tatis, you know, just the Tatis thing and right. And just anytime he's up, it's it's must see. You know, Machado, I've always been one of my favorite players. Xander, I could watch hit all day. But then on the San Francisco side, a couple of new faces. Like, I, I'm excited to just see how some of the new faces look there. And then on top of that, Jung Hu Lee, you know, making his, mm-hmm. his major league debut. Uh, and that's also very fun. I think that's a blast of a matchup. Logan Webb, one of the best arms in the game. And then Darvish is just, you can watch him do his thing anytime and have a blast. Even when he's not on, it's just so fun to watch him pitch. Yeah. All right. You got pick five now. Go back to back. Back to back. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to reach for a fun one here. I'm going to go Detroit at Chicago because I, I, I want to watch this game. Tarek Skubal versus Garrett Crochet. That's crazy. I, I know, I know. But ah, actually, I just realized the Astros <laughs> Are you gonna rescind? Just on the board. Yeah, 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 I rescind. That's a terrible pick. Um, <laughs> I tip my hand, though, for my next pick. Nestor Cortez versus Framber Valdez, Yankees Astros. I forgot that that's still on the board. Of course, I'm going to go Yankees Astros. Nestor, a friend of the program. Framber, I think he's going to bounce back. I, I, it's crazy to say bounce back. He had like a 3 4 last year, maybe even better than that. Yeah. But I think he's going to have a really, really strong year this year. I, I think Nestor looks healthy and good. That's going to be fun. And Yankees Astros, you're tuning in anytime. Uh, and I think both of those teams are going to be really strong this year. That's got to be the other pick. I, I'll leave Tigers White Sox on the board for you because I've got two picks right now. That was nowhere close to the top of my list. Because <laughs> I mean, that White Sox lineup is miserable. By the way, did mm-hmm. you see Jordan Leisure made the roster? That's also why I'm picking it. I'm ready to see him maybe pitch in high leverage if uh, but I don't know if Griffal likes Leverett, whatever the hell that whole ramble was. Yeah. But. Well, and Crochet, Crochet is probably going to go eight innings, right? Most teams <laughs> yeah, stretching training. them all the way out. I saw it. So the White Sox put out a video on Instagram of like, you know, it was a Crochet hype video. And the top comment was 3.2 innings pitch masterclass. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, we're at that point now. Um, I go first to two. So this is the sixth overall pick. I'm going to Kansas City, Twins, yep. Royals, Pablo Lopez, Cole Reagans, influx of money into the Kansas City, you know, rotation, lineup, all that. The good vibes at Kaufman are a thing. And Pablo is a Cy Young sleeper. The Minnesota Twins, you know, are they are they still really good? I think the answer is yes. So Minnesota at Kansas City is pick six. We got 15 games that we're picking from. Seven, I'm going to LA finally. 
the Dodgers open at home, Tyler Glass now against Miles Michaelis in St. Louis. Is there appeal in Miles Michaelis? Not really. No. <laughs> is there appeal in the Cardinal lineup against Tyler Glass now? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And is there appeal in the first game that matters for Shohei Otani at his new home ballpark? Yes, 100%. So that's my next pick, St. Louis at the Dodgers. I'll go Castillo Bayo in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Like Bayo, I'm I'm interested to see if the how the Arsenal looks. If there's any like subtle tweaks, I haven't kept up with them in spring training too much. Uh, but he's still a fun guy to watch pitch. But really, really about watching Luis Castillo. Uh, Seattle is also just another team I'm really excited to watch this year. Several new faces. I want to see Polanco out there. See how he does the Mitch Haniger reunion. But but no, these are just two teams that I think are going to put up plenty of runs this year. And I'm interested to see how Castillo comes out against a pretty good Red Sox lineup. And uh, I'm very interested to see how Bayo fares against, you know, a, a very formidable you know, Mariners lineup as well. It's just a, a fun matchup. Okay. And then my next one, I'm going to go for that reach. That Detroit Chicago uh, matchup. I, I get it. Chicago, I, I, I'll i probably close my eyes uh, in, in the bottom half of it. No, I won't because I'm going to just watch Tarek Skubal just mm-hmm. bully people. Like it's, I almost get to watch like it's, it's going to be like Jacob deGrom and his rehab assignment in low A. I'm just going to watch Tarek Skubal absolutely obliterate the White Sox. That's going to be really fun. And then Crochet, like there's there's tons of intrigue there. What does Garrett Crochet, the starter, look like? You know, that's going to be fun. And then how about this Detroit lineup? There's a lot of fun young players in there that I'm always excited to see from a Riley Green to a Kerry Carpenter to a Spencer Torkelson to even a Parker Meadows. This is a very intriguing young offense. I think it's going to be a fun matchup. All right, we're through nine, so we've got 10, 11, we've got six left because there are 15 games. Uh, pick 10 for me is in South Florida, Pirates, Marlins, Mitch Keller, Jesus Lazardo. I'm interested to see Lazardo take on that young and pretty exciting Pirates lineup. you got O'Neill Cruz back healthy. Henry Davis is going to catch. What does that look like? Then the Marlins... Does Luis Arise go two for five? Is he 400 to start the year? Because we're going to be on 400 watch again. Um, I'll be fascinated by it. So I I will go Pirates Marlins. And then after that, I don't know if this is a reach, but give me Nats Reds in Cincinnati because I want to see what the hell Frankie Montas looks like. Frankie, what is that lineup card read for David Bell? Um, And then Washington, is is CJ Abrams going to swipe two bags? Is Joey Gallo going to make contact? There are enough storylines for me. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I, I mean that one's all right. Uh, <laughs> I'm excited to see Montes. I, I, I hope he throws the way that people have been buzzing him up to be. What would what was the pitching matchup going to be between Milwaukee and New York? Uh, Freddie Peralta and Jose Quintana. That's still on the table. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, I'll go with that one. I mean, these are two good teams, and I want to see. At least pretty good teams. And I want to see Freddie Peralta throw any day of the week. Uh, I love all the young hitters that Milwaukee has as well. I uh, get to see Chorio. Uh, again, just a bunch of talented guys in that lineup. I know that one's postponed, but that that's what, what I would go with. Got you. All right. You got one more, and then I have the final two picks. Oh, what do I want to leave you with here? You're definitely tuning in to Oakland at home. That's going to suck. You're definitely tuning into Kyle Freeland. And then, so, yeah, uh, give me, I mean, dude, give me Patrick Sandoval versus Corbin Burns in Baltimore. Okay. Um, like, I'm not excited to watch Sandoval, but I'm excited to watch Corbin Burns make his Orioles debut. I get to see a healthy Mike Trout, which, you know, anytime he's in the lineup, I want to watch. Logan O'Hoppy's back. Zach Neto's healthy again. I, the Angels, look, they, they're they annoying, and I, I don't really care about them too much, but uh, I'm always going to tap into Mike Trout and some of the young guys. And uh, I mean, the Orioles are our must see TV. So I, I, I mean, that, that game kind of fell into my lap. Give me that one. I can get behind that. Uh, 10 10 first pitch in the desert. Zach Gallen, um, I love him. So I'll take him as the second to last pick against Kyle Freeland. Ezekiel Tovar just got a bag. Is he really good offensively after getting the bag? I hope so. Um, he's a young guy. I, I love that deal for Colorado and the Rockies are my new favorite team. So, uh, I got to watch my new favorite team play against, you know, one of my favorite pitchers to watch in the game. And then the last pick Shane Bieber and Alex Wood. 
There is intrigue here because Bieber was up to 93-94 in spring training. If Bieber goes six in Oakland, is it 93-94 or is it 89-90? That is a question that I need answered for my sanity. Um, yep. And Oakland's Oakland. So that's what I got. Cleveland at Oakland is... Uh, Daryl Arnaez. Daryl Arnaez. Cleveland His at debut. Oakland is the worst game on the calendar, and it's still has an intriguing storyline. We're so back. It's opening day. Um, it's going to be great to talk to you guys for like 45, 50 minutes, all five days during the week. It'll be some assortment of of us three with you. Um, it'll be some assortment of you know two of the three of us tomorrow to recap opening day. And uh, I, don't, I feel like we don't say thank you enough. I feel like Peter says thank you plenty, <laughs> but... I need to do a better job of saying thank you to you guys for for tuning in. The off season is really fun for us because you know we were the weird kids that were fascinated by contract structure and all that when we were like 12, 13 years old. But I know that it can be a drag for a lot of baseball fans. Thank you for bearing with us through yeah. the off season. And this is really the fun stuff. As much as we enjoy the off season, it's way better to turn on the TV and watch baseball and react to that baseball that's happening. And we're going to do that for the next seven months. So buckle up. And enjoy, and we're so thankful to have you along. Uh, I mean, you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, just for us to even be able to do this continuously through the off season because people actually support it and listen is is so amazing, and you know, inspires us to try to come up with content ideas and fun stuff to keep you entertained. But thank you for allowing us to do that and and giving us feedback on what you know what plays, what doesn't, and then during the season, it's still more of the same though. If you guys want us to do certain things or cover certain things, let us know in, in the comments on YouTube. But I mean, it's it's so surreal that we're starting another season, then we get to do this and 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 do it every day. So I, I'm eternally grateful to those who have listened and those who share the show with people. I, that's my favorite thing too, and yeah. and help us grow it and and say, oh, I shared it with all my friends. I'm like, really? Like, we should hey, like, offer you like a referral bonus. Like, yeah, hey, like, it's bucks, crazy enough play. that you listen to to us like several times a week. You're 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 bring, you're dragging your friends into this. Like that's so cool. And and again, I. Just it's surreal that I we get to do this. So uh, I, I'm eternally grateful for that as well. Hopefully for you guys, we get you a little flash sale in the next couple of days. I think we might be doing that little flash sale. We're, uh, in we're terms out of, of stock of the rope hats. I got to re up. Wow. Wow. Yeah, uh, still still awesome. hoodies and long sleeves and all that. Oh, yeah. Everything else. Everything else. But the rope hats, we got to re up. All right. We'll re up on the rope hats. But for now, get like your hoodies, long sleeves, all that. Um, our network is awesome and our network is expanding. We've got a quirky show with Javier Reyes, baseball versus the world. But I mean, just fantasy baseball is kicking ass. Mm -hmm. Rami Lavi, Vince D'Amato, they have been awesome getting you prepped for the season and they will keep you up to date on waiver wire uh, streamers, uh, all that stuff. Um, the call up is is firing through the top 100 in detail. Go listen to that. And uh, Clubhouse Chatter with Kevin Henry has been great. That'll be every Monday during um, well, every Monday during the season. You'll hear from you know a, a new player, and you'll yeah. Get, like, so he's he's in the clubhouse getting sound from guys as the season's going on, and and you're getting you know just some kind of behind the scenes information and and just context to what's going on. It's a great way to start your week and and catch up with. Yeah, so many different players because he's going to be all over covering different games. And just a reminder that we're kind of in the playoff push with basketball and the Just Basketball show is going really well, too. So Chris Manning and, and Brendan Clean, they've been doing a great job and, you know, been putting a bunch of stuff on social media. And if, you, if you're into the NBA playoffs and all that, uh, be sure to tune in to uh, the Just Basketball show as yes. well. But that's uh, that's it from us. Happy opening day, everybody. And we will talk to you to recap it all tomorrow.